Remember uh, where we were at the end of this morning, uh, talking about the changes that had taken place in New England. Um, they were very major changes, and it's important that we understand something of the scope of those changes in order to appreciate all that Edwards was and, uh, and did. Um, to put it bluntly, uh, Edwards lived and ministered in the midst of a culture of extreme theological change. Let me give you just one example of that change. Uh, one of the oldest churches, maybe the oldest church in America today, um, the Old Ship Church in Hingham, Massachusetts, was uh, founded in 1681. It continues to have worship services there uh, on a regular basis. Um, one of their pastors was a man named Ebenezer Gay. He probably would change his name if he were pastoring today, but that was his name. He pastored the old ship church in Hingham from 1718 to 1787. Think about that. He never missed a Sunday in the pulpit. And he died while preparing for the Sunday morning worship service on March 8, 1787. When he became pastor of that church in 1718, he and the church were Orthodox Reformed. They would fit right with us. When he died, he and the church were Unitarian. That's a mark of the way in which the climate, the theological, the religious climate of New England changed. One man, one church, when he became pastor, he was a Puritan. When he died, he was a Unitarian. That is the world in which um, Edwards operated. I, I would suggest to you that uh, something of the degree of the importance of Edwards as a, as a great theologian, but also as a cultural figure, is reflected in the fact that um, Yale University, secular Yale, um, established the Jonathan Edwards Center at Yale, and uh, last November, less than a year ago, has pu published the Edwards Encyclopedia. Now, I, I don't know about all theolo but I don't know of any other theologian for whom we have an encyclopedia of every topic he ever addressed. Um, and it's very remarkable that a place like Yale did that. Um, I'm encouraged a little bit in that the man who's, who was the director of the project that produced the encyclopedia uh, grew up in the church that my wife and I attend, PCA Church in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania. Um, I've given you an outline, and I'm not going to go through all that outline. You will notice that I've uh, bolded some of the um, items on the outline of his uh, key dates. Um, and the ones that I have emphasized are those which deal with Edwards in the context of religious revival. Uh, you'll see that um, he, he was just nine years old when a religious revival swept the small town in Connecticut where he was, where he was living. You'll also notice little things like he um, began college at the age of 13, already knowing Greek and Latin, what's wrong with the rest of us. Um, when he graduated from Yale, now he's all of 17, he delivered the valedictory address at that graduation ceremony. He was, and I love to claim this, he was pastor of a Presbyterian church in New York City for, uh, for a year. And um, maybe uh, that shows something of his wisdom that he left after a year. Um, but you look on down through those um, dates and you'll see how often uh, something related to revival, awakening, 
uh, spiritual matters uh, comes up in um, in the timeline of his uh, of his life. Look down at the very end of that timeline. Um, he um, he had been ministering to uh, evangelizing actually a group of Indians in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and he was when he was called to be president of the College of New Jersey, which we now know as Princeton University. He uh, assumed office there on February 16. He was very uh, supportive of the sciences and uh, therefore, since a smallpox epidemic was raging in New Jersey at the time, uh, volunteered to be inoculated and um, he died about a week later from complications of that inoculation. The uh, central focus that I would like to suggest we've, we uh, spend our time on is how to identify genuine spirituality. And going back to some things I said this morning, one of the uh, contributions, shall we say, of um, New England Puritanism was to bring to the fore the idea that churches should be made up only of those who have a credible profession of personal faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, that seems normal to us today. That was not normal in the uh, 17th century when the Puritans instituted that in Boston. And uh, Edward's uh, work could be summarized in a whole bunch of ways. One way is that he focused his attention on how to identify genuine Christian spirituality. And that has uh, all kinds of uh, applications. Uh, if, if X is the way in which we identify Christian spirituality, then preachers ought to preach toward X. Uh, sessions uh, should examine with those criteria in mind. It's, it's a very, very important question. And it's one that I, I believe is of great relevance today. Now, Edwards, most of Edwards' ministry uh, can best be understood at, against the background of the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening um, occurred somewhere, it depends on when you start it, when you stop it, uh, 1738 through about 1748. And um, I, I would suggest that the most important of Edward's works deals with the Great Awakening in a very particular kind of way. And I would suggest to you, very humbly of course, that this is the most important book ever written by a human being. Other than that, I don't exaggerate very much. Um, the Great Awakening. Uh, may have been the most traumatic event in American history. That's awfully strong language too. Uh, but let me um, mention just one thing. On a, an October afternoon in 1740, um, a small crowd of 30,000 people gathered on the Boston Common to hear a, an awakening preacher named George Whitfield. 30,000, uh, I can see the yawns in the audience. But uh, keep in mind that at the time, Boston was the largest city in the colonies with a total population of 10,000. So on one October afternoon in 1740, three times the total population of the largest city in the colonies gathered to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached. Um, the um, Great Awakening, and, and many scholars have pointed this out, was the first national event in American history. That is, in the same period of time, around 38 to 48, you had events, revivals, all related, occurring throughout all the colonies at the time. So the Great Awakening, I think, can be reasonably said to be the first national event in American history. I've 
indicated the positives. There were um, distinctly negatives as well. Uh, once the enthusiasm was built up about what the Lord was doing in all these revivals and all these conversions and all this awakening, um, you began to get some extremes being presented. Uh, one particular one was that um, frequently an individual who, uh, a man who was converted, really felt called of the Lord, uh, would go preaching throughout the country with no ecclesiastical oversight at all. That, uh, th that created a lot of division within the already established churches. And um, indeed, uh, the Great Awakening then produced the first formal split, uh, the formal schism in the Presbyterian Church in, in the United States, in what became the United States. So there, was, uh, uh, there were some negative aspects involved in the very positive event that we call the Great Awakening. And those negative aspects uh, created pushback uh, in, in many ways. Um, many of the established ministers went on record as opposing the Great Awakening. Um, the, the, the people were coming into their parishes, preaching without a license, uh, taking away their, their church members and, uh, and that sort of thing. And that in turn, all of that pushback that in turn um, got some of the people who were involved in the awakening very upset. And um, probably the best example of uh, that is a sermon that was preached on March 8, 1740 by a man named Gilbert Tennant, Presbyterian minister in New Jersey. And uh, his sermon was entitled, The Danger of an Unconverted Ministry. What he was basically saying is that those ministers who opposed any part of the Great Awakening were unconverted. They were not even Christians. That, that, was, that was a horrendous thing for any, any man, much less a, a minister, to say about ministers who took a different theological position. Now, I happen to be a, a fan of the Great Awakening. I happen to think that those who opposed it were wrong. But the last thing I would do is preach a sermon saying that those who took the opposite position were not even Christians. Well, that was, um, that, that was the state of things in the, um, in the 1740s, all throughout, from Georgia to Maine. That's what was going on. Um, and to a significant degree, the treatise on religious affections, which I'm going to focus on for the rest of our time, was Edward's attempt to try to get at what was the heart of what was right, and at the same time, to warn against things that were wrong in the awakening. Um, here is... Um, here is what he said was the, the purpose of his book, The Treatise on Religious Affections. Now listen to this, even it's, you know, it's, it's 18th century language, try and get past that. Just listen to what he says. It is by the mixture of counterfeit religion with true, not discerned and distinguished, that the devil has had his greatest advantage against the cause and kingdom of Christ counterfeit Christianity. It is plainly by this means that he, the devil, has prevailed against all revivals of religion since the first founding of the Christian church. Think about that. That's a pretty broad statement. It is by counterfeiting Christianity that Satan makes his greatest gains. And so, Edwards writes, this is really his, his premier treatise on, on all that was going on in the Great Awakening and in, in the churches generally. Um, 
he's writing to try to help the church in that day and in this day to distinguish between the genuine and the counterfeit. That's the whole purpose of, uh, of this book that I think is fairly important. Um, as with all of his writings, Edwards works from a text. And um, the text for this, uh, this work is 1 Peter 1.8. Whom having not seen, you love. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of joy. Um, the treatise on religious affections is divided into three parts. Part one is Edward's attempt to define his terms. What are religious or any kind of affections? Edwards goes on in that part to say, true religion, in great part, consists in holy affections. Genuine Christianity, he says, consists in holy affections. That's what he's going to be talking about. He goes on. Yet it is evident that religion consists so much in the affections that without holy affection there is no true religion. Ooh. No light in the understanding is good. Still his words. No light in the understanding is good which does not produce holy affection in the heart. Um, the first part is a pretty heavily philosophical section of the book. Of the book. But I think that what he's saying is, act, could actually be summarized relatively simply, and I think still accurately. Um, when you think of who you are, how do you even define who you are? And basically, Edwards is saying, um, you are not defined by what you do. That doesn't define you. Um, you are not defined by what you think. Your ideas don't define you. You are defined, to take Jesus' words in Matthew 6.33, you are defined by that which you seek first. That's who you are. Whatever it is that you seek first, that identifies you. And those, what you seek first, those are your affections. Your affections have to do with the, the, the basic orientation of your heart's desires. Now, of course, they may be informed by good theology or bad theology, but in, in essence, you are that which you seek first. Um, Edwards is, is doing this to try to get at both the good and the bad of the Great Awakening. And uh, I'll, I'll try to provide some practical implications uh, toward the end. Well, what are some, part two of the affections, what are not signs of genuinely holy or gracious affections? I mean, these are things that are often used um, to identify, gee, that's really great Christian, or it's really bad, you know. But they're often used, but they shouldn't be because Satan can counterfeit these. He can counterfeit all of them. He... Um, I'm a little, a little uncomfortable when anybody gives 12 this and 12 that, but he does give 12 non-signs, and then he's going to give 12 signs, and I'm not going to talk about all of them anyhow. But um, I do want to go over six of the non-signs, things that are often identified as um, being related to true spirituality but aren't. Um, number one. The, the, the fact that you have deep and powerful yearnings, longings. 
you have profound affections. It depends on what the focus of the affections might be. The, the, the depth and the profundity of your seeking something first doesn't make that to be Christian. So the deep and profound affections may not be Christian at all. Secondly, the fact that your affections have effects on your body. Let me get maybe a little bit too uh, practical here. Um, is it the case that um, if you have a worship service and everybody's raising their hands, it's a great worship service? Well, I'm OPC, you know how I would answer that question. <laughs> um, well, is it a sign that if people are raising it, is that a clear sign that it's not of the Lord? Edward said, no, it's not a clear sign either way. Raising your hands in worship, any other effects on the body, you feel, you feel excited, you, you, you cry. That's not a sign one way or the other. It's not good, it's not bad. You can cry, you can stay stony-faced, and neither of them is automatic. But, but often, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll hear people talking about how, how moved they were, and I was just weeping in tears. Well, um, tears are great, but they can be shed for all kinds of reasons. Number three, fluency in religion. That is, you know theology backwards and forwards. You could recite the Heidelberg Catechism all the way through without a mistake. Remember, Edward said, remember that the most orthodox theologian in the universe is Satan. He knows it all. He's not a Christian. Something's missing in Satan. And we're going to get to that in a moment. So absolutely perfect knowledge is not necessarily a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a non-sign, but it's something we often use. Spontaneity is number four. Oh, I didn't seek this, it just came upon me. Well, <laughs> lots of things come upon me, and uh, I wouldn't want to say that every one of the things that just comes upon me is, is, is of the Lord. Spontaneity. That may be a sign, it may not be. Um, number five, they follow a certain order. And, and you often hear this kind of thing in our circles. You know, I felt very, very uh, despairing and depressed and everything. And then I went and I saw all these people raising their hands and they were shouting with joy and now I feel so much better. Well, that could be genuine Christianity. It could be something very different. Satan is a master counterfeiter. Number five. Number six. Confidence. I have absolute assurance of where I am right now. Well, that, that could be good or it could not be so good. It depends on where that assurance is ultimately focused. You see the kinds of things that Edwards is talking about. And these were the kinds of things that were uh, uh, erupting in some circles of the Great Awakening. I mean, Gilbert Tennant, I'm absolutely certain that anybody who opposes the Awakening is a non-Christian. Baloney. That does not mean that that confidence is biblical confidence. All right. So much for the things that are often used but shouldn't be. A couple of things that should be used. Um, first of all, Edwards does have a very heavy theological component. Um, genuine, gracious affections can only be caused by the Holy Spirit. There's no other way. You, you can't rev them up from within you. Now, that's, that's still more theoretical, but it's a fundamentally important place to start as you're talking about what are gracious affections. The heart of it, I think, comes in number two. Now, these are things that are signs 
of gracious affections. I'm going to read just a little bit longer quotation from Edwards here. This is, by the way, the third part of his, the first part was on what are affections, second part was on what are often considered genuine affections but are, third part is the, the, the genuine article. Here's what he says. The exercise of true and holy love in the saints arise in this way. They do not first see that God loves them and then see that he is lovely, but they first see that God is lovely, that Christ is excellent and glorious. Their hearts are first captivated with this view and then consequentially they see God's love and great favor to them. The saints' affections begin with God. The saints' affections begin with God. And he talks at great length about this. He, he spends a good bit of the treatise talking about the, 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 the moral excellency, the holiness, the beauty of God. I was trying very haltingly to do that kind of thing in the sermon this morning, to point to, wow, what a God this is we have. He's a running father. Edwards does so much better than, than I could ever do on that, but that's, that's basically the point. You, you look at who God is. You look at what God is. And that's the foundation for the, your affections related to him. The deepest desire... Next one. The deepest desire is to love God more. I just want to love you more. I want to, I want to serve you. I want to um, bring more delight to you, Lord. That's, that's the prayer that Satan cannot counterfeit. Lord, grant that today I may bring delight to you. Remember that little chorus? Take joy, my king, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. It's that fundamental desire to bring to God that which delights God. Um, the... Um, Deepest desire, as I said, is to uh, love God more. Here's the way Edwards puts it. The more, the more a true saint loves God with a gracious love, the more he desires to love him. And the more uneasy he is at his lack of love to him. The more he hates sin, the more the, the, more the saint hates sin, the more he desires to hate it. The more he thirsts and longs after God and holiness, the more he longs to long and breathe out his very soul in longings after God. You see, as I try to do weekly this morning, it's all about God. It's not about me. It's all about God. And the, 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 that's the thing that Satan simply cannot counterfeit. A focus on the glory and the worthiness and the beauty of God himself. Um, the, the last of the items that Edwards mentions, I'm not going through all 12, the last of the items that Edwards mentions is um, the longest. He spends more time on this one than on all the others combined. It's what he calls evangelical obedience. Um, and I would suggest, as I indicated in the first hour that this is Edward's way of solving the typically reformed problem of why those who are saved by sovereign grace obey God. Uh, my little way of summarizing it, and I think it's Edwardsian, we obey God not to get anything from God. We obey God in order to give God the glory that he deserves. Think of, think of the moral law in Scripture. What, what is the moral law in Scripture? What are all the things that God tells us? 
the moral law in scripture is really nothing more or less than an externalization of the nature of God. That's, the, that's why God gave the law he did. He was externalizing his own nature and saying, do that. Why? Well, because when you, when you do do that, you are imaging him. You are reflecting God's nature back to him. That's, that's where it started in the Garden of Eden. And that's what we lost, that, that reflection of God's very character back to him. So whenever, whenever you obey something that the Bible teaches, you're doing it not to get something from God, but to give to God the honor which he deserves. The focus is entirely on the Father. That's, I think, one of the, one of the powerful, powerful uh, contributions that Edwards makes to all of the, yeah, it's not totally new with Edwards. You read back, you read Augustine, you read Calvin, it's all there. I think that, um, I think that Edwards brings it into uh, contemporary experience better than anyone else. We obey God not to get from God, but to give God what is his due. So we, we delight to obey the word of God. We delight because that brings joy to the heart of our creator and savior. I'd like to suggest a few implications. Um, first of all, with regard to personal piety and devotions. I know I, I maybe nobody else does. I, I struggle with this and I've talked to my wife about it and tr trying to address it. I, I just find so often that my prayers and concerns, my devotional life are focused on, oh God, cure this person of cancer. Oh God, help me get through that weekend in Iowa. Uh, oh, you know. So often, the, the, the entire focus of my devotional life is on asking God to do things for me. And so I've, I've, had, I've asked my wife to help me recalibrate my devotional life so that the fundamental focus is on giving God what he deserves. Let, let, let me suggest to you that the prayer that Jesus gave his disciples is a, is a great example of, of how we should work it. It begins and it ends. If you take the uh, ending in Matthew as the genuine ending, it begins and ends with a focus on God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Then there are legitimate requests, absolutely. Absolutely. But they're bracketed by the focus on God. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. If, if, I learn, if I learn to bracket all of my devotional life that way, I will be a better servant of Jesus Christ, I think. Um, church membership. Um, you know, we talked in the first hour about um, the visible saints criterion in New England. But what, does that, what does that look like? Um, how, how does that uh, appear? Um, let, me, let me try an example that may be dangerous, and Mark can report me to my presbytery if he wants. Um, in our presbytery, one of the... Uh, issues that's always raised with a new person coming in for ordination is um, what you think about the days of Genesis 1. 24 hours, 23 and a half, symbolic. And uh, on the floor of Presbytery, that particular issue can go on for hours. Now, here, I think that's important. But I've gotten to the point now where after all that's happened, um, 
I ask my little question. Mr. Smith, could you tell the presbytery what it means that God is your creator? However long it took him, whatever process he may have used or didn't use, what does it mean in your life that God is your creator? See, I think that's, that's getting at the heart of what Genesis 1 wants to teach. Maybe it's teaching length of days. Maybe it's not. It definitely is teaching that God created all that is and all that is owes him obedience and worship and honor. So that's the kind of thing that I would suggest to sessions or groups when you're, when you're choosing who's going to come into the church. Just keep questioning to ask, why, why are they doing this really at bay? Is it, again, dangerous? Is it just in order to escape hell and go to heaven? That's a good reason. <laughs> um, and if you do trust in Jesus, you will escape hell and go to heaven. No question about that. But is there any sense of just what this God deserves from me? How beautiful, how exquisitely wonderful this Father that we worship is. There ought to be some sign of that in those we question to be ordained to the ministry or to be members of the church, I think. Uh, here's another one. Um, evangelism, missions, prayer for others. Um, there have been all kinds of discussions of um, appropriate techniques in, in evangelism and missions. Um, and I'm not enough of an evangelist or a missionary really to pass judgment on which of those is most effective or whatever. But I do know, or at least I think I know, that if we go into missions uh, with the idea that the most important thing is to get that person saved so he doesn't go to hell, we're missing something pretty important. The most important per thing is to get that person saved so that he'll God, give God the glory that God is due. Again, the focus is on God. And, and that, that kind of focus will tend to keep us from making mistakes in the way we do evangelism and missions. Yes, the person who's saved will go to heaven and not to hell. But oh my, how much greater it is that when a person is saved, he will sing the praises of Jesus for all eternity. And Jesus deserves that, don't you think? Um, and that's, um, that, that's how I'm trying to learn to pray for others. Lord, you deserve this person's praise. You deserve this person's worship. Lord, make it happen for your sake, not primarily for his sake or her sake. Make it happen because you deserve praise from that person. Preaching, I do such a terrible job of it, but that's what I try to do. I, I try to give at least a, a, a tiny glimpse of the nature of the God about whom we've been speaking. Just a, a little glimpse. This, this is the sort of God we have. He runs after Pharisees and, and uh, scribes as well as disobedient sons. He runs. And the instant he sees a sinner turning toward home, he's off like a shot to welcome him home. That's the God we serve. And that's what I think preaching needs to be. Uh, whatever else, yes, it's got to be exegetical. Of course it does. 
I, I happen to be real big on expository preaching. Um, a question that I used to teach my homiletic students, uh, because I hadn't learned it myself primarily, what do you want happening in the heart, in the hearts of the members of your congregation at 1205? What do you want happening in the hearts of your congregation five minutes after the service is over? If you can't answer that question, you can be fairly sure nothing's going to be happening in the hearts. You, you want the hearts burning with worship and glory to the Lord. That's what I try to teach and try to do. Um, I'd like to recommend two books. That's the academic in me. Sorry about that. Um, the first book is, um, is old. Um, but oh my, it, it, it has done so much for me. Uh, Jim J.I. Packer's Knowing God just talks about what it means to know God and why we should want to know God. University Press, 1973. A more recent book, um, a book that won Christianity Today's Book of the Year for 2015, Fleming Rutledge, The Crucifixion, Understanding the Death of Jesus Christ. The author so describes that through which Jesus went on behalf of sinners like me. I can't read it, even reread it, or reread it, reread it, without affection toward that Savior. That's the, that's the point of the author. Not just to tell you the facts of the crucifixion, but to tell them in a way that cause you to rejoice and to worship the Savior. So that's um, my little thing on Jonathan Edwards. Um, I just, I went a minute over. Um, we take a couple of questions. Yeah? He says yes, so we can. Or, or uh, objections or corrections or whatever. Okay. Well, that means it was either so bad that they don't want to. <laughs> I'll stick around for a few minutes afterwards. Uh, so if you do have questions that you didn't want to say in front of everybody, I'd be happy to try them. I, I even, even at my present age, I, I still find religious affections hard reading. It's not easy. It's written in 17th century, uh, 18th century language, um, and it's, um, it's heavy. Oh my. When you, when you catch a glimpse of the truth that Edwards is describing, all I can say is, praise the Lord.